Hey, I hope your Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, or Sunday's going well. Before we continue my first ever journey through the Harry Potter series, just a few quick announcements. First, in less than three weeks, Potterless is going to be live in Portland, Oregon on February 17th at one o'clock at the Sentinel in Portland, which yes, if you're asking, is the hotel where they film Fifty Shades of Grey. Tickets are $10, 10 fucking dollars. That is nothing. That's a bowl with guacamole at Chipotle. That is a beer and a third in New York. Go to listenupportland.com right now. Get your tickets. You can see Potteros. You can see Spirits. You can see Horse. It's going to be a great time. We're going to be doing a multitude meetup as well, but I would love to see you at the show. It would be so great. It's going to be super fun. I already have the chapters lined out. It's going to be what Kelly has called, quote, a juicy chapter. So again, go to listenupportland.com and get your tickets today. In merchandise news, I'm happy to announce that everything available on the Potterless merch store at bit.ly slash merch on is back in stock. So the Little Bagman posters, the Little Bagman shirts, all of the house cup shirts, the pins, everything is back in stock. After posting some pictures on social media, people didn't realize that we have a merch store. So if you didn't know, we got one. And if you go to bit.ly slash merch on, everything's back in stock. Aren't you so happy? I'm so happy. Please go get some stuff. That's all really good stuff. And the shirts are really soft. Speaking of things that are really soft, we have new patrons to welcome to the team. And that makes me feel all warm and fuzzy inside. So shout out to Ellie Ackeson, Catherine Bounds, Lola Scoins, Brianne Allison, Zhao Carlos Martins Costa, Kayla Resmussen, Tasha Brown, Genevieve Hubner, Anna Martin, Alexandra Santana, Aga Miku Washu, Julia Pena and Pauline M. A pronunciation correction for Paolo Padaihug. Shout out to Harper Caldwell and Sean Stewart who upgraded their pledge. And a huge shout out to Linnea Sievert who upgraded to producer level status. And a shout out to our newest producer level patrons, Veronica Bartova, Everly Kindred, and Kevin and Harnoy. They join the ranks of Leanne, Vicky, Aaron, Erica, Calvin, Sadie, Jesse, Natalie, Deborah, Clow, Alex, Frank, Marchis, Motori, Samantha, Juan, Jenna, Kieran, Rebecca, Abid, Caitlin, Rosemary, Jill, Marie, Lisa, Ariel, Ramina, Kamal, Anthony, Russell, Dustin, Kitty, Audra, Indiana, Eleanor, Sydney, Billy, Rosanne, Micah, Andrea, Nikita, Colette, Trina, Lala, Chelsea, Taylor, Lovekesh, Ali, Cassandra, Roxy, Amelia, Sean, Jeremiah, Sarah, Jesus, Ben, Rachel, Zachary, Jessica, Natalie, Arna, Brandy, Melody, Kristen, Zach, Elisa, Tiago, Daisy, Jessica, Orchid, Jonathan, Joe, Steve, Vivian, Samuel, Victoria, Elena, Takari, Darlene, Drake, James, Haley, Marino, Moster, Pinky, Hannah, Angelina, Ross, Marie, Peter, Maria, Phineas, Natalie, Hermione, Victoria. Lee, Alex, Brian, Caitlin, Cecily, Raul, Finn, Mosin, Grace, Sammy, Raul, Ingen, Mari, Brianne, Heidi, Alexandra, John, Jen, Sefran, Dusty, Noel, Tao, Hala, Emily, Michael, Robin, Rebecca, Patricia, Jane, Will, Neil, Liz, Mariah, Brandon, Vittorio, Sarah, Claire, Teal, Sina, Silje, Desiree, Rory, Gloria, Sarah, Patrick, Alicat, William, Haley, Gloria, and Can't I Bother? Who never forget their lunch in their fridge. They always remember to bring it to work or school. If you want to be like one of these amazing patrons and get access to director's commentary, bonus episodes, my notes, exclusive merch, you can go to patreon.com slash Potterless. But without further ado, let's get into episode 62 of Potterless, covering chapters 8 and 9 of Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows, guest starring Eric Silver from Multitude. <laughs> Another episode of Potterless, the tale of a 26-year-old man reading the Harry Potter series for the very first time. My name is Mike Schubert. I am that 26-year-old man, and I am here joined by a fan favorite, one of many, so that I don't want to make the other co-hosts that we've had upset, but someone that people have been clamoring for me to have back on the podcast for a while, my good friend and fellow co-host of our podcast horse, Eric Silver. Eric, how's it going? Oh, hello. Fancy meeting you here, Michael Schubert. I know. It's so funny that we've run into to each other on the internet. Yeah, and we both have an hour of microphones. And let's just record something. It's almost like we've been planning this for a week or so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's fine by me. But yes, Eric, you are here to discuss chapter eight and chapter nine of Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows, which was the first set of chapters that had some lightheartedness to them. I knew you're going to be on later in the book as well. I think I'm going to have you on for that camping part that everyone apparently hates. Oh, good. I'm ready I for don't it. know when it comes, <laughs> but I wanted to have you on. But the first seven chapters, like a lot of people die and stuff. And I was like, man, I can't make sweet, sick killer jokes with Eric if people are dying left and right that'll be in poor taste I mean I had a lot of Mad-Eye Moody jokes that I was gonna unleash on you <laughs> a lot of quality Mad-Eye content just some real good like really nailing them but now he's dead so I can't do it <laughs> Well, kind of. There's a, a thought that he might not be dead, but we'll have to see. Well, sure. who knows? Jury's out. But let's get right into it. So chapter eight is called The Wedding, and we start with the wedding getting ready to begin, and Harry Potter is polyjuiced up as a random muggle redhead boy that Fred stole hair from via Accio, which I think is phenomenal. Do you know what the boy's name is? No. Did, 
Do you? Yeah, it's it's right here. Oh, what's his name? <laughs> Ottery Saint Catchpole. That's his actual name. I don't know if that's the name of the local village or the name of the muggle, but that is a name that is in the book. <laughs> okay, hold on. I want to pull this up. I, I, I'm surprised I didn't look at this. It's the first page. So that's the name of the village, not the boy. Oh, I thought the boy was named Ottery Saint Catchpole. Because can you imagine? They, they just stole his hair. They would have stolen his hair and they'd be like, oh, quickly, what is your name, sir? Uh... Uh, uh, Ottery Saint Catchpole. Like, Thank you, and then disapparate. <laughs> I mean, that is absolutely something Fred and George would do. <laughs> I wouldn't put it past them. So yes, that's the name of the town, which is a very fancy and funny sounding town. Ottery Saint Catchpole. Oh yes, Ottery Saint Catchpole. Oh yes, are you, white are you here? only. Are you here? Oh, oh, ah. That's what it sounds like. I'm sorry. Oh, gross. Ew. I was gonna make a joke about like playing uh what's the uh croquet and having luncheons yeah we're the, so the same joke so here, here's a question about luncheons is there any difference of saying luncheon versus lunch like does the eon signify anything different i think it's fancier and <laughs> um <laughs> no it's it <laughs> or i guess like a luncheon is a party and lunch is a meal so you eat lunch at a luncheon you are asking the wrong person okay. i just eat lunch i i have a personal vendetta against the word luncheon because the first time i ever read the word luncheon was in sixth grade and we were doing popcorn reading in my english class where different students read out and then you say popcorn whoever and then somebody else reads so i was reading this out loud and i've never heard or read the word luncheon before because i'm not some snooty croquet playing loser from ottery saint catchpole yeah exactly so i didn't grow up there so i've never seen or heard it before so i was reading out loud and then i said lunchy on and then everybody laughed uh you know i pronounced lunchy on like it was a damn evie evolution uh i said lunchy on and then everybody laughed and i was like what's wrong and then my teacher was like oh michael it's pronounced luncheon and then i said then why is it spelled lunchy on and she goes i'm not sure <laughs> But from then on, I've hated the word luncheon because it made me look dumb. I'm traumatized on your behalf. <laughs> you know what else makes me look dumb? This podcast. Harry is pretending to be Cousin Barney and the Weasleys are just banking on their other family members just being flummoxed about how many Weasleys there are and just believing it, which is great. There are so many Weasleys. There's a lot of Weasleys. There's so many. So many. We learn that Percy isn't showing up, confirming that he is the absolute worst. He's not going to his own brother's wedding. And they don't even say why he's not going there's no reason or ruse or whatever he's just not showing up which is like come on dude this is your brother your own brother i think we're gonna meet a worse weasley no way i know we're going to you think aunt muriel is worse than percy absolutely 100 percent. Mm, okay it was close i think they are maybe it's like a 1a 1b in terms of worst situation but i still got percy in the last place all right we'll see i'm just saying watch out okay she gives him a run for the money though she's very terrible yeah but we're gonna get there i have many thoughts about Aunt Muriel. but she's like old and kind of crazy whereas percy is a young adult and is actively choosing to do things that make his mother cry and his father get very upset. Yeah, but like Aunt Muriel has been doing this for like a hundred years though. And I feel like she's always been terrible. Yeah, but you got to give her like that old lady credit. You don't know that she's always been like this. She's 107. She might just be like, ah, I don't care. No filter anymore. No, we we actually do know that she's been doing this the entire time. Wait, why? We'll get there. We'll get there. Okay. All right. But anyway, uh, Percy sucks. He's not showing up. Uh, George asks the question of he's not coming, but who wants him? Which hard same, hard, hard, hard same. As more people arrive, George says that he's going to help out the Vila cousins understand the British customs. Mm hmm. But then Fred one ups him, runs ahead of him, talks to two very pretty girls in French, and then George is just stuck with the middle aged relatives that they arrived with. It's good. Fred is phenomenal. He is distinctly the better of the two twins. There's no contest. Tonks arrives with her quintessential watcher. And she knew who Harry was right away because she recognized that he was some person she's never seen before. She then explains to Harry that the reason her and Lupin bounced so weirdly and abruptly last night when they found out Scrimger was showing up is because the ministry is being very anti-werewolf at the moment. And Lupin, werewolf, didn't want to be there. Huh. So that's why they just kind of skadoodled. But Lupin still looks really sad, and we don't know why, but Harry keeps pointing it out, so in about five to ten chapters, we'll eventually learn why he actually is so distraught looking. I mean, that doesn't surprise me when the most xenophobic person on the face of Wizarding World takes over the Ministry of Magic. Yeah, it's uh, kind of bad. Yeah, I think that, that werewolves are going to kind of be on the outs. Yeah. 
for sure. We next see a wacky dressed wizard in a very interesting yellow getup, and it's Xenophilius Lovegood. So yeah, it's, it's your boy. Dad. And I'm kind of uncomfortable with how close his name is to xenophobia. Yeah. I don't, I don't know if it's like the abbreviation Xeno, does that have to do with being from the outside so to be like xenophilius is like full of being on the outside so his name is i guess a representation of how wacky he is i thought xeno was like interior xeno oh xeno is the prefix meaning relating to a foreigner or foreigners okay so i guess being close to xenophilia means like he likes foreigners so I guess in this case, it would be monsters. It's a really good name. But yes, I think the only word that I've actually come across in my life that has to do with it is xenophobic. Yeah. Because I don't think anyone ever says like, oh, I'm a big xenophile. I just love foreigners. Like, that's not usually how it's distinguished. It's, hi, I'm a good person. Traditionally, you're either a good person slash what someone should be or you're xenophobic, which means you suck. Oh, yeah. If you're xenophobic, please stop listening to this podcast. Yeah, that X, the X in the beginning <laughs> makes me uncomfortable. You don't like words that start with X? No, just like I know that like seeing that X to start things like very few things can go well from an from a. Let's a, see how many words with X's we can say. Xylophone, X-ray. X-ray. <laughs> and X-Men. those two things are not good. X-Men uh, are X-Men very good. <laughs> X-Men were very good. Are there other words with X's? There's going to be so many people on Twitter just tweeting us words that start with X. Hey, uh, people on Twitter, (laughs) um, go over to my Twitter account, uh, El Silvero, E-L underscore Silver O, and I want you to write something out, and then right when you're about to send it, throw it in the trash, (laughs) because I don't care. (laughs) Just throw it in the trash, please. Thank you. Oh my this has been a PSA from Eric Silver. Thanks. <laughs> so apparently the love goods live just over the hill. And Luna is there as well, which makes me very excited. Luna. She runs up to Harry and just says, hello, Harry. And he is surprised that she was able to pick him out because he's supposed to be Barney. He says, no, 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 I'm Barney. And she goes, oh, you've changed that too? And Harry goes, whoa, how did you know I changed my appearance? And she says, ah, just your expression, which is great. I don't know like how Luna is able to do this, but she's brilliant. She's absolutely wonderful. She is the single smartest person in the, it's this, these, all of these books. She's amazing. She is quite fantastic. Ron comes back with Auntie Muriel, who is talking mad, mad smack. She says that Ron's hair is too long. She says that it's so long that she at first thought he was Genova. And she then goes on to say that Mr. Lovegood looks like an omelet because <laughs> he's wearing like it's described as he's got this like wacky yellow suit with like weird suspenders and all this stuff. So she says he looks like an omelet. And then she asks who the hell Harry is. Harry says he's Barney. And she goes, oh, man. Hey, Ron, where's your friend Harry Potter? I really wanted to meet him at the wedding. <laughs> and Ron's like, oh, he's, he's not coming. He can't make it. OK, so I have two things about this part. <laughs> OK, one. I recently listened to the episodes that were when you were in New York City last with uh, Amanda and Julia from Spirits and with Kelly. Mm -hmm. So I remember all the hot fire flames that Ginny Weasley threw at her brother. Mm -hmm. And the last thing. So this is the Aunt Muriel that he is supposed to be kissing. He's the only person that he's ever kissed. Yes, this is the Aunt Muriel that Ginny threw the insult that this is the only person he's ever kissed. And now that we learn that Aunt Muriel sucks, it makes Ginny's insult even better. She's the worst. She's pretty bad. She's the worst. And the other thing is Ginny's full name is Ginerva. <laughs> yes, I don't know if I've discussed this on an episode yet, but her name is Ginerva. Which is amazing. Yeah. Ginerva the God. (laughs) Her and McGonagall should be best friends. They're the best. And I've mentioned this before, but we need like a buddy cop movie with Ginny and McGonagall, Minerva and Ginerva. Like, let's do it. It's called Irva. (laughs) Irva. (laughs) Inerva. It's called Old Witch, New Witch. Oh, Old Witch, New Witch. I like it. And then all of the promotional stuff, you know how movie posters always usually have one little tagline underneath? All of the taglines are play on words where witch is used in place of bitch. And it's all kind of things like two boss ass witches uh, or two badass witches I like or it. witches give stitches. <laughs> like, something about Harry it. Potter. I never met that son of a witch. <laughs> Uh, yeah, he is the son of a witch, technically. Yeah, look at yeah, that. There you go. Hmm. Do you think that is somehow used in the wizarding world where someone's like, oh, you son of a bitch, and it's like, how dare you? I'm a son of a witch. <laughs> no, that would require too much thought from J.K. Rowling. Oh, hey, no matter what you say about J.K. Rowling's writing, one thing that she is top-notch at, elite level, I cannot think of an author that is better at it, 
writing insults and comebacks, she's very good. Like anytime Ginny or Ron or Fred and George or Harry are throwing around sass or insults at people, McGonagall too, she is unprecedented at it. Very good. So you can knock her for her world building. You can knock her for her magical system being broken. You can knock her for writing the worst sport ever invented. But one thing she is damn good at is writing witty comebacks to people and good insults. She's very talented. I guess. I don't know. I just read Cursed Child, uh -huh. which you'll read. I will. I will read and I'll watch the play. I got tickets for it. Oh, I'm, I really want to see the play, but I just read the script mm -hmm. and I have feelings about it. So I'm just like a little burnt out in her writing right now. From what I have heard is that it just doesn't really translate as well because this is how it was explained to me is that it's not a book. It's just the screenplay or just the dialogue. Yeah. And there's a difference when you have just the dialogue of Cursed Child because there's not as that's much like, like that's descriptive. Like all plays. Yeah, but I don't I don't read play dialogues for fun because it's not as good of a experience. I think the thing is the thing that really is a, is a letdown of reading a dialogue versus the book is that in the book you have so much like narration and like scene setting and world building type stuff where she gets to describe all of the things. And in a play, there's only so much that you can do in the brackets that like describe what the backdrop looks like. But by having a book with the narrator, you can be very descriptive and explain how everything is working and how people react and how things look and all kind of stuff like that. So I think that's why people say reading the screenplay or reading the dialogue isn't as great, but seeing the play itself is phenomenal. I hear you. All great. That's not why I have feelings about it. Oh, okay. <laughs> also, okay. I was like a dramatic literature major oh, gross. in college for a hot second. So gross. I literally read plays uh -huh. and uh, you can do so much in stage directions. Yeah. And she actually does a lot in stage directions. I think that they're buck wild, but there's this late stage Harry Potter, which I kind of think about the seventh book and then kind of everything that's followed afterwards where... She spends a lot of time. I feel like this whole thing is about putting like importance to the story. Like she needs to put this bow on it, and it, it just keeps happening and keeps. She keeps like she's putting twenty bows on the Harry Potter universe. Oh, so you just don't like that she's doing a bunch of spinoff type things? No, I think that she feels the weight of the Wizarding World, mm -hmm. and there's this feeling that needs she needs to tie it up and make it nice at the end. Oh, oh, so the fact that the cursed child is like a happier ending or something whereas maybe the seventh book doesn't end in a very happy way as you read this i think you're going to start to feel that she's trying to like inject a ton of importance onto this story okay and then the cursed child is like an extension of that because you know you're dealing with something that happened after the course of this massive event and she's like we need to reckon with this the big things that happen mm. in book seven uh, okay it's all about trying to communicate how important the harry potter saga is uh, okay and i feel like there's a lot it's 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 heavy both with like emotion and with like plot structure i bet it pops when it's on stage but like thinking about it and like as i've read it I don't know. You'll see. Yeah. You'll see. I will see. I will see. And I'll do an episode about it. Fear not. You want to know how I know that you were a, a fancy pants English major for a hot second? I still was, but why? Oh, uh, because, because you called it Harry Potter and the Cursed Child. Like your damn William Shakespeare over here. Is it not Cursed Child? I mean, it's... No, like it's just the Cursed Child. You know, like the word. Like a human says. You know, like people. Hey, Mike. <laughs> do you know how I know you weren't a fancy pants English major? Why? Because you think it's funny to point out my accents oh. that I put on Cursed. Also, that is the meter of the titles. I, th I thought you were going to say because I didn't know the word luncheon. <laughs> also, that too. No, that too. <laughs> it's like the meter of the title. It's like Harry Potter and the sto and the and the Goblet of Fire, the Cursed Child, the Order of the Phoenix. Like they all have that meter. Uh... Go do math. Go do science somewhere. I get it. No, I, I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. Because it's, yeah, Deathly Hallows, Goblet chamber uh order yeah so it's always it's always like a two syllable type thing chamber oh you said chamber but yeah yeah is it all of them yeah let's let's go through all of them no philosophers three syllables yeah well that's because the title got all changed but like two to seven it's pretty much that it has the same yeah. meter. chamber prisoners three and then goblet and then order and then half blood and then deathly so yeah it's it's always multi-syllabic and cursed is just one. And with prisoner, like the emphasis is on prison 
and er is just like kind of at the end. Arr, okay. Yeah, look at us describing things that nobody cares about. So Ron then sees Hermione and he says that she looks great. And then Hermione hits him with always the tone of surprise, which was a sick callback. Clearly Hermione's been taking some improv classes at Second City <laughs> because she is bringing back stuff from a couple chapters ago. Hey, <laughs> hey. Apparently Muriel had just said mean things about Hermione before. Hermione saying that she overheard Muriel say that she has bad posture and skinny ankles. So at this point, I was fully on board the fuck Aunt Muriel train. This lady sucks and she can go hang out with Percy and I can hear about neither of them, please. And please let me learn about Charlie and good Weasleys. I don't want to keep learning about these bad Weasleys. <laughs> Hashtag bad Weasleys. <laughs> So Fred and George start talking about their great uncle Billius, who used to be the life of the party. And he's described as thus, quote, he used to down an entire bottle of fire whiskey, then run onto the dance floor, hoist up his robes and start pulling bunches of flowers out of his. And then Hermione butts in before George can finish the sentence. Yes, he sounds like a real charmer. It was jeans. <laughs> he was going to say jeans <laughs> out of his pockets. Then Ron says, never married for some reason. And Hermione says, you amaze me. And they all laugh, which is very adorable. And I very much enjoy Ron and Hermione becoming more cute and coupley. This is something I very much look forward to because I think they are perfect for each other. I'm glad to see more of this witty banter happen between the two of them. But, of course, now that they get coupley, all of a sudden... Enter Victor Crumb! A new challenger approaches. Victor Crumb enters and Ron is disappointed. Mm -mm. So... All of the people in attendance at the wedding are very interested to see Victor Crumb there because he's a world famous international Quidditch star. And Ron is very grumpy about it when him and Harry go off and take their seats. He nudges Harry and says, did you see he's grown a stupid little beard? Got him. And then the narrator says, quote, Harry gave a noncommittal grunt, which is the correct response to this. This is very much exactly what you do as a friend. Like you do this grunt that like semi agrees, but also kind of sends the message of just drop it, Ron. At the same time, it's perfect. But I bet it was a dumb beard. Yeah, I believe it. So there are very pretty descriptions in the book of how everyone in the wedding party looks and how beautiful everyone looks and how the scene looks. Very good scene painting work by J.K. Rowling. But the best part of the entire scene painting is that she says when Fleur arrived to the altar, Bill looked as though he had never met friend or Greyback, which is uh, it's just such a good visual to imagine him smiling so much and looking so happy of his bride to be that it doesn't even look like he has these awful scars all over his face. I just found that to be really sweet and I kind of, you know, choked up a little. It's kind of nice that even though these two people like individually kind of suck, mm -hmm. they're still allowed to find love. Yeah, I, Bill, Bill doesn't suck. The worst thing about Bill is his awful sense of style. But other than that, Bill's cool. Yeah. But Fleur kind of sucks. Eh, I mean, Bill's not great. They're just, I mean, they're on the hierarchy of Weasleys. Yeah, rank it. Okay, ranking Weasleys. This is something I haven't done in like 50 episodes of Potterless. Let's rank Weasleys. Okay. Number one is either Charlie or Ginny. I'm going to say Ginny just because we know more about her and Charlie is purely based off of potential. Yeah. Oh, for sure. So then Charlie, number two. I'm going to put Fred three. Okay. I'm going to put George four. All right. I'm going to put Molly five. Mm. I'm going to put Ron six. I'm going to put Arthur seven. I'm going to put... Bill eight and then Percy nine. Yeah, I think that's fair. I think the twins are closer than you think they are. In terms of Fred and George? I think Fred and George are like both. They share three. I think they're tied for three. I Fred just over once the fifth book started, all of Fred's insults and quips were better. I mean, you've been reading Harry Potter very closely for the last few years. Yes, I've been taking very... Well, because it, it was for a while where I, I kind of didn't like that they were just kind of lumped in as their two people, but you just view them as Fred and George. I tried to pay very particular attention to what separated the two. And once the fifth book came around, all of Fred's insults were very good. Like all of the ones that made me audibly laugh out loud when I was reading are Fred. I want to put Ron and Molly higher. But it's like, I don't know. But who do you, yeah, but how do you displace? The only thing I could see, I could understand if people want to displace Charlie just because we don't learn about him. But I think if we knew anything more about Charlie, he would be so good. I mean, the dude is phenomenal. He's a dragon wrangler. He's a cool guy. Right? And he's buff. He's thick with two C's. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just like it. Everything's good about him, but he has like a rat tail and a bullet. Yeah. So has that been described? I just got to the point in Harry Potter Hogwarts mystery where you meet 
Oh, are you are you just joking that like everything's great about him, but he has bad hair? Yes. That's, oh, thank okay. You. I was afraid. I was afraid that that was actually described, and I missed it. No. I uh, what okay. I love about your improv and comedy skills is that you explained my joke. Okay. No, this was just clarification because I thought the wrong thing at first, and I wanted to make sure I knew what you were saying. I do lots of improv. I'm not bad. Uh, <laughs> it's all right, luncheon. Let's keep it going. Oh God. Okay. That that's a complete non sequitur straw man argument. That has nothing to do with. It. <laughs> all right luncheon let's go god damn it uh yeah i just got to the part in harry potter hogwarts mystery where you meet charlie weasley and it's very unfortunate he has a ponytail but it's like a not full-on ponytail it's just like his hair is kind of like tied in the back and it made me really sad because <laughs> i was like oh no charlie no but you know we've all had bad hair before i had a bowl cut for like five years it was a very dark chapter of my life yeah okay i'm gonna say something i'm gonna say something bold go for it i think molly is better than the twins. Ooh, okay. I could see it. I just love their insults so much. I know, but I think that she's just like a very good person. Mm-hmm. And she's really important to the plot of a lot of a lot of very boring chapters of mm-hmm. Harry Potter. If she wasn't like such a strong maternal force, then it would be very boring. And she also makes Arthur better, which yeah. is very important. I think it's very valid. I think a lot of people would have Molly higher. I just... It's purely a personal taste thing for me, and I just like people that have good old comebacks and fun little jokes. <laughs> Classic shoes. That's just me. Classic. Classic me. So the ceremony itself is being held by the same wizard who presided over Dumbledore's funeral, which I think is interesting. And Ginny is up there as one of the bridesmaids, and she sees Harry in the crowd and winks at him. What up? It's editing Mike. Upon further inspection, there's a bit of confusion as to whether or not Ginny winked in response to Aunt Muriel saying her dress was too low cut, or if it was just the most perfect coincidence of all time. Regardless, Ginny Ginny's perfect and I love her forever and I wanted to make sure that we all fully knew the full context of this wink. Which, girl, you know what this is going to do. This is going to send him into this big old multiple paragraph long daydream. That's exactly what it does. (laughs) So he has a daydream until the wedding ceremony actually ends. And when it ends, this craziness happens where the chairs float into the air. The marquee vanishes, so it's just a canopy with golden poles. And then molten gold forms like from the middle and spreads out and forms a dance floor, which all of this is phenomenal. But here's my question. The book never says what happens to the chairs. Are they just suspended in the air the whole time? I think so. And I think they come back down during the actual reception okay. like for the tables when they eat food. Oh, uh, okay. But, you know, it's magic. Who cares? They can just be floating. I don't know. I just I thought it was a funny thing where it's like that Thai flying lantern ceremony thing, but it's all chairs. <laughs> Good. It was a very funny visual for me. Like I was imagining because they always have those videos of the of the dramatic, you know, you take the Thai thing and you light the candle and then you like raise it up above your head and very slowly everyone does it at the same time. I imagine the exact same like cinematic looking thing, but it's everyone holding a chair. And then slowly floating it into the air as cinematic music plays in the background. It's so beautiful. This chair represents my troubles. My butt used to be there. Wow. Wow. It's a metaphor for life. (laughs) And my butt. It's a metaphor for butts. (laughs) So after all of this happens, Ron turns to Hermione and says, Hermione, cop hold. Let's grab a table. Do you know what the phrase cop hold means? Is this something that I'm missing or is it British? No, it's British. I got nothing. So for that, we got to turn to our UK correspondent, Dottie well, James. Well, I can tell you exactly what cup hold means. Pip, pip, cheerio. <laughs> That's good impression. Nailed it. And now it is time for British Quandaries with UK correspondent, Dottie James. To cop hold of something means to grab hold of something. To cop a hold. To cop a feel is a different thing that can be used. To cop a feel. Yeah, just means to grab hold, take hold of a thing. This has been British Quandaries with UK correspondent Dottie James. Wow, thanks Dottie so much. Now we know what cop hold means. So they see Luna sitting at an empty table. They walk up to Luna and she says that her dad went to give Bill and Fleur their gift. Ron asks if it was a lifetime supply of gutty roots and Hermione tries to kick him under the table, but she kicks Harry instead, which I think is fun. I don't know why this was in the chapter, but 
good old antics here. There's some good local color. Mm -hmm. So the band starts playing a waltz song, and Luna says that she likes the song. So she gets up and walks out onto the dance floor and then just starts revolving on the spot, waving her arms with her eyes closed around in a circle. Here's my question, though. Luna says she doesn't like dancing. She just likes feeling the music. Oh, okay. She just wants to feel the vibe. This is the best way for her to do so. <laughs> she just loves the vibe. <laughs> she is just a feeling it. But the unfortunate result of this happening is that Victor Crumb takes her seat. Oh, no. And he asks who the man in the yellow suit is. This is Xenophilius Lovegood. Ron replies in a tone that is kind of saying, like, don't make fun of our friend, explains who he is, saying that he's a good dude, he's Luna's father, etc., and Ron then turns to Hermione and just says, come and dance. And Hermione is taken aback, but also pleased. So she gets up and walks away with Ron and they start dancing, Cute. <laughs> which I love it. <laughs> so good. Crumb then turns to Harry and asks if they're together. Harry says, sort of. And Crumb then says that if Mr. Lovegood wasn't a guest of Fleur's, he would attack him right now because apparently the sign on his chest, which is, was described as a strange triangular eye, is Grindelwald's sign. And here is my question. I mean, I guess this might be a spoiler. So don't answer me if this is a spoiler. So I guess I'm just, I'm asking this into the ether. But is this the triangle with the circle in it? Like the Deathly Hallows thing? I know that is a logo for the books and stuff. I have no idea what it means. But they said triangle, and then that's a triangle. But if this is Grindelwald's sign, that's not good. So I don't really know what's up. So uh, this is just like the first thing that came to mind. This was weird because I thought it was like the Illuminati sign. Mm -hmm. Like what you see on dollar bills. Yeah, like the pyramid with the eye on it. Yeah, that's what it literally sounded like. Maybe Grindelwald was the Illuminati. Illuminati. Yeah, I thought that's what J.K. Rowling was doing. She just put the Illuminati in there. <laughs> yeah, I think it might be different because it's a triangular eye, which I don't think that the Deathly Hallows thing is, unless it's like very deconstructed because it's like a triangle with a circle in the middle. So I guess technically like an eye and a pupil, but I'm not really sure. But I'm assuming this would be the equivalent of like a dude wearing a swastika on a suit, right? Where that would be very mad. I mean, Grindelwald might not necessarily be on the scale of Hitler, but I and other people have jokingly called him Wizard Hitler a lot. Right. Is that a fair comparison? Or I really? don't know. I think this is interesting, though, because we're talking about like regionalism here. So it's like Crumb thinks it's weird, but... But no one else does. Yeah, but no one else does. I mean, Harry even makes the point that he probably just like saw it somewhere and like didn't know what it was. Yeah. I think the thing is that Crumb notes that Grindelwald went to Durmstrang and he wrote that symbol in the school on a wall, and then a bunch of people started adopting the symbol. So maybe it's something where outside of Durmstrang, it isn't really a thing, or outside of people that went to Durmstrang, nobody really knows what it is, and not as necessarily public as the swastika was. Because yeah, I think it must be, as you're saying, a regional thing that no one here that has been in Britain their whole life, nobody there understands the significance of it. Otherwise, I'm sure other people would have been upset because I don't know what Grindelwald did, but I do have the understanding that he's a very bad dude. Right. I mean, the most famous thing Dumbledore ever did was defeat him, so gotta be a bad guy. Sure. I still think it's Illuminati. Let's go with that. That's canon now. We learn from Crumb that Grindelwald killed Crumb's grandpa and a bunch of other people. Harry says, as you mentioned, that Mr. Lovegood probably doesn't know what the symbol actually means. He says him and his daughter are very unusual and eccentric, so maybe it was just something he picked up like in a thrift store and doesn't really know what the meaning behind it is. Crumb asks why Luna is flailing her arms around on the dance floor, and Harry says to probably get rid of Raxpert, quote, Harry recognized the symptoms, which I love these moments where Harry just knows Luna's weird quirks so much that he just kind of takes them for as they are. We got a little bit of this in the sixth book when he brought her to Slughorn's Christmas party for the Slug Club, and I just love this, where Harry's just like, oh yeah, that's Luna, she does this weird stuff, but she's my friend, so it's chill. Yeah, they're really kind to Luna in a way that they aren't to pretty much anyone else like they're not this kind of neville no they're not this kind of neville they're not this kind of the creepies luna is basically it and i know she's amazing but like i wish that they could just be this kind to other people yes and it wasn't like such a chore to be nice well this is something that miel brought up in the episodes that she was on in the first one she says do we really have any proof that harry's a good dude aside from him saving the world because honestly he's very quick to judge people and he's like pretty mean and sassy and like doesn't necessarily respect his elders and all that like who is harry nice to just for the sake of being nice without any sort of personal gain no one i agree with that it's like the only people he's nice to are you know he tried to be nice to cho but that's because he had a crush on her and then he's nice to ron and hermione yeah but like it's not like he's nice to any random students 
he was so annoyed with the Creevies when he had like these younger students that were big fans of his. And he was like, oh, this kid's so annoying. Good. I think we'll realize, and as book seven unfolds, that Harry Potter is the story of a teenager who doesn't know what to do with his destiny more than an actual hero story. It's like people putting fate upon him. Yeah. I mean, I think it makes it interesting that he's not perfect. But we do have to realize he's not a super nice dude. No, agreed. And I think that also like the stuff with Dumbledore and like what he kind of leaves him to do. I mean, you're just kind of like forcing this massive choice onto somebody who's not necessarily that great. He's just like destiny picked him. Yeah. So after this, Crumb takes out his wand and much like a video game character where you just kind of let your player sit for a while and they just start doing random stuff, uh, he takes out his wand and then just hits it against his thigh a couple of times and it makes sparks fly out, which sparks at Harry to scream Grigorovich and Crumb is very confused and then Harry has to kind of backtrack it, but he realizes why when he first heard the name, it made him think of Quidditch, but it was not that Quidditch player that Ron asked because he remembers Ollivander in in the fourth book mentioning to crumb when he looked at his wand that his wand was made by Grigorovich and Harry blurts out that Grigorovich is a wand maker and crumbs like yeah I know and then Harry has to quote wildly improvise to crumb and it's like oh yeah I, I uh I read it in a fan magazine that Grigorovich made your wand and crumb says I don't remember ever talking about my wand in an interview huh, whatever <laughs> So Harry then tries to very slyly ask Crumb about Grigorovich. He's like, yeah, what's uh, what's that Grigorovich guy up to these days? And Crumb says, I don't know. He's been retired for several years. I was one of the last people to get his wands. Aren't you Brits more usually obsessed with Ollivander? <laughs> so not really sure of what Grigorovich's deal is now. But Harry is now certain that this is why he saw that vision of Voldemort wanting him. It's that Voldemort wants to get a wand because Harry's wand was able to first off defeat Voldemort's wand itself because it had the matching core, the feather from the same phoenix. And then when Voldemort tried to use somebody else's wand, it was not as powerful and Harry was able to fend it off when Voldemort was trying to attack him on the motorcycle. So his thought is that Voldemort is going to this dude to try to get an equally powerful wand that is not made at the same core against Harry. Uh hmm. The plot thickens. Indeed, it does. Uh hmm. <laughs> so Crumb then notices Ginny and says, Wow, she's good looking. Is she one of your relatives? Crumb still thinks that Harry is Barney at this point. And Harry says, Yeah, but she's dating someone. Uh, uh, he's a big bloke. Uh, he's a jealous type. You shouldn't cross him. <laughs> Which I think is so good. It's good. But uh, Crumb's next line, I want like cross-stitched onto a pillow. Go ahead and say it. Go go for it. I'm going to put on my best German accent as I do it. He's not German. He's from Bulgaria. Oh, so I don't have a Bulgarian accent, so this is going to be German. Eastern European. Oh, okay, great. Okay, so he takes his goblet and then drains it and gets to his feet and he says, What is the point of being an international Quidditch player if all the good-looking girls are taken? And then he storms off. And here's my question. Why does J.K. Rowling have to make all of the other champions suck? Like, Fleur was nice and fine, and now she's awful. Crumb was also really sweet in the fourth book, and now he's a douchebag. Like, why do, why do we have to do this? Why do we have to smear campaign everybody? I don't understand. It's, I don't think he doesn't, like, suck. He just, like wants to hook up with somebody and he's a celebrity <laughs> yeah like i i get it that it's not the worst thing it's not the worst but he was the type of guy to be so nervous to approach hermione who was like not a popular girl at all he was so nervous to approach her in the library even though he was a famous quidditch star I don't know, maybe this is just piling on with the regret that he really liked Hermione and he got his hopes up and didn't know that she was with someone. But I don't know. The general vibe that I got from Crumb in the fourth book is that he was a good dude. And then this one just like, it's not awful. Doesn't make him look super good either. Definitely flattens him out. But now he seems like he's somebody from Wedding Crashers. <laughs> yeah, that was like the vibe I got. And that's just like, uh, it's just something that from the way that they set up Crumb in the fourth book, where he seemed really nice, it doesn't seem like something Victor Crumb would actually say out loud. And it kind of made me disappointed that he did. Oh, for sure. 
but at the same time, it's hilarious and totally out of left field. Yeah, I mean, it's funny. It just the only part of it that bums me out is that he seemed like such a nice dude before. So the night goes on and Fred and George have disappeared with some of the cousins. Uh Charlie is singing with Hagrid and some other short wizard. And the way it's described makes it seem like they're drunkenly singing this song, which I think is phenomenal. Charlie. Harry then notices Doge sitting alone at a table and this is the guy who wrote the eulogy for Dumbledore in the Daily Prophet you know what was weird about the eulogy it was just like wow such Dumbledore oh good (laughs) wow it's 2018 and we're making doge jokes look at that Good. I hope that's how you actually pronounce his name. I bet it's Dodge, but let's say it's Doge. It's Doge. I mean, if it was Dodge, there'd be a D in it, right? Yeah, just like luncheon. There's no D in luncheon. There should be. Uh, where would it be? In the front. De luncheon? <laughs> no, it's a silent D. <laughs> so Harry tells him his true identity, and Doge is excited. <laughs> Sus eulogy. <laughs> wow. So wow. Harry tells him his true identity. Doge is excited, says that he wanted to write to Harry after Dumbledore's death, but never got around to it. And Harry says that he absolutely loved his obituary. Um, oh, I said eulogy before. He didn't really write his eulogy because that's different. Wow. Such, <laughs> words, so, words such obituary. Mean thing. Such obi- yeah, now you have to start saying such obituary. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder how many tweets were crafted in the 20 seconds where people were like, no, you said eulogy, not obituary. <laughs> hey, everybody on Twitter, you know what I want you to do? <laughs> Throw it in the trash. <laughs> We love you. I love all the tweets. Just maybe not the ones that correct me on tiny, tiny, minor, minuscule details. Hi, I'm Eric, <laughs> representative of Michael Schubert. Take all of your tweets, throw them in the trash. Don't do that. Just maybe the annoying ones. So Harry says that he loved the obituary, and he asks if he saw the article about Rita's book. And dude, Doge was quoted in that article. Of course he saw it. Like, I don't, oh, Harry's a buffoon. Doge was in that article. Ugh. I don't know, man. This kid's an idiot. Harry's gonna Harry. Uh, st- uh, st- uh, ugh. Ugh. Uh. So Doge's face gets, quote, flooded with an angry color. And the only angry color that I can think of is violent purple, which J.K. Rowling has used multiple times. So in my head canon, his face turned <gasps> violently purple. All right. Sounds good. I mean, that's an angry color. <laughs> I would say so. I agree. So Muriel then unfortunately butts in and she sticks around for like five pages. So she says that she loves Rita Skeeter. You know, I already didn't like her. Now I really don't like her. And Doge is visibly stiff. He does not want to deal with this, especially with someone who is going to go on to sass the hell out of Dumbledore and try to dunk on him and give so much praise to Rita Skeeter, who Doge clearly hates. So Muriel says, oh, come on, before Dumbledore is famous, there were loads of fun rumors about Albus. And she then suggests that Dumbledore got rid of his squib sister. Doge takes offense to this. Harry says, a squib? I thought she was just ill. And Muriel said, oh, well, you heard wrong. Doge butts in saying that this is untrue. And Muriel then goes on to smack talk Dumbledore's mom, suggesting that she locked Ariana, Dumbledore's sister, in the cellar because she was a squib. I don't uh, I don't like this whole section. I don't like this at all. And I really just want to know the truth so I know which person or people to not like. So Doge also denies this. Muriel says that back in the day, having a squib was really embarrassing and it was usually easier just to ship them off to a muggle school so that they could just adapt to muggle society and be a part of the muggle world because it was so embarrassing. And this is like an unfortunate truth situation of things that could have happened in the past where, you know, if someone had some sort of disability of sorts, people would very incorrectly be embarrassed by it rather than take the appropriate measures and next steps to try to help this person out. It is kind of like an old school type vibe of like, oh, something's wrong with this person. I'm embarrassed rather than this person is at a disadvantage. Let me try to do whatever I can to help them and make their life easier. Yeah, there was a real parallel between having magic and magic and like sanity versus insanity. Mm -hmm. Like this locking someone in a basement or like the woman in the attic. Exactly. Uh, You know, that trope that pops up in a lot of literature. Like Jane Eyre. Yeah, there you go. Good job, Mike. You have read at least one book. I mean, I was forced to read books. I've read at least six books. That's true. (laughs) That's a good point. (laughs) Um, So I think this is where J.K. Rowling using magic as a representation for like injustice in uh, modern society I think that kind of works yeah and then of course when people do terrible things it's like oh this is the direct relationship between like people with magic and people with not so I wish that she leaned on stuff like this more I think if you introduce too much or you ignore gender race 
all that inequality in your fantasy Mm -hmm. as well as introduce like these extra layers that are like supposed to be comparisons to those modern struggles or Mm -hmm. these real life struggles i feel like you lose a lot i wish she had kind of like leaned on stuff like this but of course this is nasty because it's all rumor yeah i agree with you we've read these books so much it's like you can't believe anyone until you get proof yes that this stuff actually happened exactly so i think it's good i i like that it was more upfront than some of the other things that it was alluding to it was very much like putting it in your face and teaching the lesson of like this is not okay and this is a thing that people used to do whereas some of the other things are not necessarily as clear and it's much better than the things that weren't made obvious at all and are apparently just implied where jk rowling was like oh yeah dumbledore was gay and my thought was she says it was implied and i don't i don't know i haven't really bought that there's nothing that's been in the books aside from seeming like him and doge had a thing it doesn't really seem like there was any sort of hint at that. That was the first time I noticed it. But I think this is something that is partially just by nature of these books being written in the 90s and 2000s versus if they were written today, it probably would have been more apparent. But I think it would have been a nice next step if J.K. Rowling just straight up said in the books that Dumbledore was gay and not just, you know, heavily implying it or whatever she says she did. The one thing I do like about this approach is that it's very clear, like, hey, even though this is a rumor, This kind of thing used to happen and it's very wrong. And this is the kind of thing that like kids could have a conversation with their parents about and they could talk about it. And I think that's really good. Yes. And someone on Twitter sent me a link to an article saying that they did some sort of study and said that if you read the Harry Potter books as a kid, you understood the concepts of prejudice and why it's wrong a lot better than if you hadn't. So ultimately... I think this book series is very good in that you have a great story that also can, you know, kind of teach some lessons without necessarily being too in your face. So I think that's nice. Yeah, sure. I mean, it's not the best thing. I mean, I didn't read them as a kid and I am very much not a racist. So I turned out fine. (sighs) I don't know. We can move on. But it's like I just I agree that these things were really formative to us as kids. And I just saw a musical that was based on like a YA novel Mm -hmm. um, that came out in like 2009. And I was just thinking the whole time, I was like, man, I really wish I had something like this when I was a kid. Sure. It's like, this is happening in 2018. I wish I had this in 2008. Yeah. I wish that there was more media. Like what were the popular moving actually supported like high grade uh, YA stuff when we were a kid? It was really just Harry Potter, like something that like publishers would invest in. Yeah, and it did a decent enough job, but I mean, it's really bad. Like, it's really bad if you go back and you watch episodes of Friends. Oh, yes. Like, that does not hold up well at all. Friends is weirdly homophobic. Every few episodes is in something about gay panic. Yeah, a lot of gay panic stuff, a lot of fat shaming, where a lot of the jokes are just like, ha ha, look at this person, they're not straight, or like, ha ha, look at this person, they're gay. It's very, very dated, and it does not hold up very well. So it's good that you have these books, the Harry Potter books, at least 10 years later, have held up pretty well. But I get what you're saying. I wish we had this stuff as a kid. I'm very fortunate that I had a very good family situation, and my parents taught me how to be nice and why I should be nice, and I was very fortunate to have that. I'm glad that more media in the modern day is being appreciative of that and appropriate of that and has things like diversity and inclusion and explaining things and stuff like that. So it's good. Obviously, you want to wish you had it sooner, but better late than never, and it can just kind of shape the opinions of future generations of kids. Yeah. I good, yeah. Good enough. <laughs> so Doge says that Ariana was kept there because of her health. Muriel asks, then why was she never sent to St. Mungo's or had a healer come to the house? And Doge is so upset about all of this that he's on the verge of tears. He clearly cares about Dumbledore a lot. Muriel suggests that Kendra, who is Dumbledore's mother, would have killed Ariana if she hadn't died first, and then postulates that Ariana may have killed Kendra in a struggle to try and escape. So now things are getting off the rails and seem to be really weird and rumory and grasping at straws. And I don't know. I felt very uncomfortable reading all of this. Oh, yeah. I mean, the next thing that she talks about, which is like the only thing that people could actually prove, Mm -hmm. was like Dumbledore's brother punched Dumbledore in the face during the funeral, which like people saw so that's something yeah but it's like i felt super uncomfortable just like because it's all rumor we can't verify whether or not this happened yeah so hopefully we get the truth of it and hopefully we learn that dumbledore's family didn't suck but yes 
Aberforth punched Dumbledore in the face, breaking his nose at the funeral because he blames Dumbledore for what happened to Ariana, saying he could have saved her. Dumbledore let him punch him, like didn't fight back, didn't try to stop him. So, you know, taking the higher road there. Yeah. So Doge is shocked that she knows all of this. And she says that she knows it because she was good friends with Bathilda Bagshot. And at this point, I wrote in my notes, is this the lady that wrote A History of Magic? And a couple pages later, Harry realizes this. So according to Bathilda, Aberforth screamed at Albus that it was his fault that she died, punched him in the face, Dumbledore didn't fight back. Muriel thinks that Bathilda is the one that gave the dirt to Rita Skeeter. Doge says that Bathilda would never do this, and this is the point where Harry Potter then butts in and goes, did she write a history of magic? Which is like a page and a half too late. They've been talking about Bathilda for a while, and then Harry just like, oh, hey, right? Like, he's he's on a huge delay. I appreciate that the narrator is not Harry Potter, because Harry needs time to, like, think about things. He, <laughs> yeah. like, tunes out for, like, five minutes. He's like, wait a second. <laughs> it's like we miss big chunks of conversation because we're in Harry's head. It's like that me where the woman is doing all of the math <laughs> that's harry all the time so harry then realizes it and doge then confirms that yes she is the one that wrote that muriel says that she is gaga nowadays which doge says is even more of a reason for rita skeeter not to try to take advantage of her and get information out of her and is a further justification to not take her word as truth that it can't necessarily be trusted Muriel reveals that Bagshot knew the Dumbledores for years and lives in Godric's Hollow, which causes Harry to choke on the butterbeer that he was drinking, which I think is great. I'm imagining a very dramatic, like, sputtering of butterbeer everywhere, like, coming out his nose and all the stuff. He then asks, Bathilda lived in Godric Hollow? And Muriel says, yeah, she was the Dumbledore's neighbor. And then Harry goes, the Dumbledores lived in Godric Hollow? And she's like, yeah, that's how neighbors work. (laughs) And Harry is surprised that Dumbledore never mentioned this. So Harry is just shook by this. And Hermione then comes back saying that she saw Victor get into it with Luna's dad. They got into some sort of argument and then he stormed off. Hermione asks if Harry's okay, but before anything can conspire out of that, a large silver lynx Patronus comes in. It's Kingsley Shacklebolts, and it says, the ministry has fallen, Scrimger is dead, they are coming, and that's the end of the chapter. Yeah. Like, what the fuck, 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 like, what, 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 what? What? It's happening, Mike. What an incredible way. This book is going to get super dark super fast. Uh, It's already dark. (sighs) Past Mike, ease up, hold your horses, because it's time for Wingardium at Ridosa. Today's episode of Potterhouse is brought to you by Warby Parker. Look, isn't it just the pits when your eyes stop working very well and you don't want to deal with contacts because they're so complicated and very easy to get lost, especially because they're see-through. You think about wearing glasses, but then you realize, ugh, these are going to be on my face and people are going to see my face all the time. Golly gee, I wish they would look pretty, but ugh, pretty glasses are so expensive. Well, Warby Parker has decided to change all of that. And I know what you're thinking. Sure, Mike, glasses are great, but I don't want to go all the way to the store to try them on, and I don't want to order them online because what if I get them and then they don't look good on my face? Well, Warby Parker has a free home try-on program. You pick five pairs of glasses. You try them on for five days. There's no obligation to buy at all. It ships free. It's got a free prepaid return shipping label, and I know what you're thinking. Mike, I just went to warbyparker.com slash potterless, and I see the glasses, but I still don't know which ones are going to fit my face. Also, I happen to have an iPhone X. Well, you're in luck because Warby Parker has an app, and using the iPhone X's camera, it can use the true depth features to see on your face what 12 frames fit you best. So even if you go through this whole process and you have no idea what to look at, you can use this app as well. Glasses start at just $95, including prescription lenses, and all of the lenses have anti-glare and anti-scratch coating because, oh my goodness, glare and scratches? Are you kidding me? The worst thing. Now, Myers are fine, but Kelly's got some funky eyes that don't work, right? And she did the whole try-on pair, and it was so easy. We picked the frames that she wanted. They are in the mail right now. She's going to try them on. Hey, Kelly, on a scale of one to really easy, how simple was it to get the glasses at warbyparker.com slash potterless? Really easy. Great. Not only do they give you some awesome glasses for cheap prices, but for every pair of glasses they sell, they give one pair of glasses to someone in need, which is amazing. It's wonderful. And again, to get your free try on kit today, just go to warbyparker.com slash potterless and start seeing better and everyone's seeing you looking fresh today. 
Today's episode of Potterless is also brought to you by Calm. At the time of posting, it is January 28th, 2019, and studies show that 80% of New Year's resolutions are dropped by February. So that means you got three days to keep it together, and Calm is here to do it. If your 2019 got off to a rocky start, don't worry. Every new day brings an opportunity to start again, to establish new habits that support your happiest, healthiest self. So whether your goal of 2019 was to relax more, or to hit the gym, or to have more focus, or to get better sleep, Calm is here. Calm is the number one app for meditation, sleep, and relaxation. You can go to calm.com slash potterless right now, and for a limited time, you'll get 25% off a Calm premium subscription, which includes hundreds of hours of programming. They've got guided meditations. They've got sleep stories. They've got soothing music or things that play ambient noise like rain. I am a big fan of falling asleep to ambient rain noises, but you can't always sleep to real rain, and sometimes a real rainstorm can be like really loud and stressful and have thunder and lightning and not stuff that you want, Calm's got that good rain, that calm, soothing rain. They got the good stuff. So for a limited time, go to calm.com slash potterless. That's C-A-L-M dot com slash potterless. You'll get 25% off a Calm premium subscription, which gives you unlimited access to all of their content right now. And you can get focused. You can be more serene and get your 2019 on track. And don't be like Rebecca, who already dropped her resolution. No, get calm now, get focused. And don't be like one of those 80% of people that drop their resolutions, especially especially Rebecca. So we get into chapter nine, a place to hide, and it's just chaos at the wedding. People start disapparating since the protective charms around the burrow have been broken. Lupin and Tonks shoot up a joint protego into the sky. Harry and Hermione are looking for Ron. They finally find him and Hermione grabs them, and then they apparate to Tottenham Court Road, which also sounds fancy, but not as fancy as the one where that muggle boy is from. Mm, Tottenham Court Road. Tottenham. Tottenham Court Court Road. Tottenham. Tottenham. So my first guess was that this is the street where Hermione's family lives, but it doesn't. It's just somewhere in the muggle world that is kind of close to her house. Hermione is completely running the show here. She's steering the ship. She's getting them on course for what they got to do. Says they got to go somewhere. They got to change. Harry's got to hide, etc. So Harry freaks out that he didn't bring his invisibility cloak. Hermione then corrects him, saying that she does have it as well as a change of clothes. Harry wonders how, and she says, quote, undetectable extension charm, which is something that hasn't been invented until this exact chapter. And she doesn't really explain how it works. Did I miss it? Or like, how did this thing get sent? Is it basically like the equivalent of apparating an object? I'm very confused of how it works. No, J.K. Rowling just made it up because she needed to move the plot along, which I'm totally okay with. Yeah, I'm okay with it too. I just wish she would have explained how it works. My guess is that since it's a extension charm, that maybe it's something like if I apparate, this thing apparates with me. Because they didn't really mention her grabbing this or anything because they're at the wedding and she had it in the Burrow house. Well, it was, I thought it was her purse. No, I, it's like a big bag. No, no, no. It's not a big bag. It's her tiny purse. And she said that it was super heavy. Oh, uh, okay. I didn't realize it was just her purse. I didn't realize she had it at the wedding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You'll see. I mean, you'll see when she tries to open it and then she can take out all the shit that's in there. Okay, cool, 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 cool. So Hermione had this bag of all the essentials ready just in case. And she had just packed Harry's rucksack in it this morning. Ron swoons about this, just going, oh, wow, Hermione, she's so great. She's so thoughtful. She's wonderful. Uh, yeah. Are you not turned on by proper organization, Shubes? Oh, me? No. I am very much impressed by her diligence to planning and preparing. I don't like that stuff at all. Kelly is very good at that stuff, and it's very nice to have that yin and the yang. When Kelly and I travel, she takes care of like all of the planning type stuff, and then I take care of the like having fun along the way stuff, and we do a great job. Our powers combined make for a good trip. Yes. Anyone who can organize a bookcase, I am like 100% there for. Yeah. I mean, Kelly organized my bookshelf. We put the book covers in rainbow order, which is fun. But you know what it did? It made people on the internet very mad when I posted an Instagram photo because the Harry Potter books don't go in color order. (laughs) One of the pictures I had with them in the background was like, your Harry Potter books aren't in order. Which I could get. I just thought it was kind of funny that a lot of people were like, how dare you? <laughs> so everyone knows that you start by genre and then alphabetically. I mean, come on, get it together. I have a fun little rainbow shelf of books. I think it looks cool. And I'm glad you find it fun, but I can't find anything on your bookshelf. Well, I only have like 15 books on my bookshelf, so it's not that hard. Well, you've only read 15 books. No, I've only read at least six. At least six. 15 <laughs> is at least six. Well, honestly, most of the books on my bookshelf I've not read because they are books that I have purchased, but then have not 
not read because I have to finish these damn Harry Potter books first. <laughs> it's a lot of basketball related books that I'm very excited to read once I finish. You're such a fake literature boy, Shoops. I'm not even trying to. I am not the biggest reader. Source, I this podcast. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Source, I didn't know what the word luncheon was. You would have ran into the word luncheon, exactly. <laughs> Boom, I got it in before you made fun of me. Zing zang. So <sighs> Harry is worried about the others at the wedding, and Hermione says, there's no time to worry, and there's no use, because they just want to attack you, Harry, so getting you out of the situation is honestly the best case scenario. Harry then, of course, thinks and worries about Ginny, as he does, but he moves on past this and asks, why did they go to this particular road? Hermione says, I don't know. It's just the first road in the muggle world that I could think of. And I figure the muggle world is safer for us to be in. People then start catcalling Hermione, which I guess it's because she's wearing this wedding dress. So it looks out of place. But Hermione's 17. So this is definitely super weird. Oh, yeah. It's terrible. Like that's. Uh, uh, e, uh, and, and I'm sure that any 17 year old girl or anyone that has been a 17 year old girl out there was catcalled at 17 because men are gross and the worst. And I'm sorry, my sister one time got catcalled and I was a witness for it. She was, Oh yeah, wait, my sister was no. Okay. My sister was 18 when this happened, but not that different. We were touring colleges in Texas because she was looking at schools that she was going to apply to. And we were walking down the street of Austin, Texas to get lunch before we took a tour of the university of Texas. And these people in one of these white vans rolled down the window and said, Hey, yo, Hey, yo, white girl, what's up? And then we walked into the faux restaurant and laughed about it for an hour. <laughs> It's very good. But yeah, I was there. My parents were there. Not the ideal time to do a cat call is when a girl is clearly with her family. You know when the ideal time to do a cat call is? Never. Never. <laughs> Throw it in the trash. <laughs> yep. So they try to think of a place to go and they see an all night cafe and they go there. They're all stressed. So Harry is there under the invisibility cloak and then Ron and Hermione are sitting in the booth as well. Hermione says that they need to find a safe place to disapparate to, and then they should go into the countryside and send a talking Patronus thing, because Hermione has been practicing this. Of course she has. We didn't even know this was a thing for six books, but of course she knows how to do it. Uh, she's been practicing that so she can send one to the Order once they get away. So two new customers roll in, bad sign, and a little bit later, we learn why, because they pull their wands out on the squad, and Harry notices, and he pulls out at the same time as they do, and he hits one of them with Stupefy, and it was the great large blonde Death Eater from the end of the sixth book. Oh. Mm -hmm. So the other one hits Ron with that rope spell, and he gets all tied up. Harry tries another stupefied, but it misses and hits the waitress. The other Death Eater uses Expulso to blow up the table. Hermione then hits him with Petrificus Totalis, and Hermione then uses Defindo. She tries it at first and misses and kind of cuts open the knee of Ron's jeans, but then she does it again and gets the ropes off of Ron. So the three of them get up, and Harry feels bad that he didn't recognize the big one, just saying, ah, oh, man, I should have known. I saw this dude when we were fighting in the last book. Ugh. Ron notes that the other is Dolohov and that the tall one's name is Thorfinn Rowl, which that's a name. And Hermione says, never mind what they are called, which hard same again. <laughs> We don't need to worry about this. There's bigger fish to fry than what this dude's name is. We later learn that the only reason that Ron went on to name this dude is so that Voldemort could call this dude by name when Harry gets possessed by Voldemort. Yep. <laughs> Everything revolves around Voldemort secretly. Very convenient by J.K. Rowling to be like, oh, shit, I didn't name this dude. I got to name him so that Voldemort can call him out. Ugh, fine. Da -da -da. Thorfinn Rowl. <laughs> <laughs> so Harry tells Hermione to lock the door and tells Ron to turn out the lights with the put outer, not the deluminator. <clears throat> and Harry says that they got to do a memory charm on them. Of course, Hermione says that she has never done this and she doesn't know how to do it, but she knows it in theory. So she is able to successfully use Obliviate and, you know, just, yep, uh-huh, here, yep, mm-hmm, sure, yep, well, okay. What I like about these two chapters is that it's, it's like the squad needs to do, like, action movie tropes. Mm -hmm. So the first thing is they're sneaking Harry into a wedding, which is, like, 50% uh -huh. of all heist movies. And now <laughs> they have to clean up, like, the this is like in Pulp Fiction, when they have to clean up all the bodies and all the blood. Oh, 
This yeah, is like yeah. totally a thing that happens. So I'm like, Jake Rowling, do, are you just making this into an action movie? She is now. They're adults. They can be action movie stars if they want to. They're 17. <laughs> they are wizarding adults by wizarding standards. So Harry tells Hermione to do it to the other Death Eater and to the waitress while Harry and Ron clear up, not clean up, clear up. So apparently British people say clear up instead of clean up, which is very silly to me. The reason that they're doing this is so that when the Death Eaters wake up from Obliviate and forget their memories, it doesn't look like a fight has broken out so they can't put two and two together. Just like the men in black. Oh, yeah, pretty much. Yeah. So Ron then tries to get his wand out and he complains that he can't get it out easily because his pants are too tight. He tells Hermione, oh, you packed my wrong jeans. You packed my old jeans. These are too small. <laughs> and then the book says, oh, I'm sorry, hissed Hermione. Harry then heard her mutter a suggestion as to where Ron could stick his wand instead, which is great. This is similar to a joke in a Pixar movie where the adults definitely get it and the kids only maybe get it. This is something where someone young reading the book might not understand, but everybody above the age of 15 knows exactly what this is implying and it's fantastic. Oh, uh, this is so Stick them back in your jeans. <laughs> you could stick it on this side table over here or on the ground. <laughs> Put it back in the pocket of your jeans. <laughs> Hermione theorizes that the Death Eaters found a way to trace Harry even though he's 17. So maybe they did something when they are in the ministry to do it. Harry is scared by this and he suggests, well, maybe I should split up and immediately Ron and Hermione shoot it down. Ron says that they need a safe space, and Harry suggests Grimald Place. Ron and Hermione bring up the fact that Snape can go back there, and Harry reminds them that Arthur told them that the Order put anti-Snape jinxes on Grimald Place. So he's the only one to worry about, but they've got protective stuff, so they might as well just go for it. So they undo the spells on the three of them and then disapparate, and this raises a huge concern for me. You're telling me, that at this all-night, assuming 24-hour cafe, which very much has the vibe of being an all-night 24-hour diner, that there's only one waitress working there and no one else is in the entire restaurant. Yeah. There's no chef. There's no busboy. There's no manager. There's no hostess. There's one waitress doing everything? Are you serious? No. Okay, I definitely think there could be just one waitress. I don't know about the cook in the back, but I think that it's entirely possible that... The cook did not come out. Like, it's that far in the back. Here's my concern with it, though. The other Death Eater used Expulso, and it was described in the book as an explosion and a table, like, flying off. That would have made a huge commotion. There is no way that the chef would not have heard this, especially if this place, like any restaurant, has a door that just kind of push opens and doesn't seal shut. He definitely would have been able to hear this amount of calamity. I... <sighs> I guess. Like, people are yelling at each other. They're yelling stupefy at the top of their lungs. Like, every spell has a yell. There's furniture going all over the place. There's no way. There's no way. You've seen, like, videos just, like, in late night, like, at a Denny's or, like, an IHOP where people just, like, fight each other. There's, like, a massive brawl. And usually people come out. Right, but people come out, but then it's, like, nothing happens after it, right? Like, the people just kind of, like... They, they push over tables and everything breaks down, but, like, nothing happens after it. They kind of just, like, one of them walks off into the night, and it's like, all right, fine, whatever. Like, this place is just, like, shitty enough that nobody said anything, <sighs> even though there was, like, a Man in Black-style mind erasing happening there. Yeah, I guess you just want to hope that... I personally want to hope that the cook is one to realize, oh, hey, I've only got one waitress, and it's this woman that maybe if there's a big fight, I should protect her or something. Not just because she's a woman, but just because she's alone. I just... Uh, maybe you're right. Maybe there is a cook, and he hears this, and he just sucks, and he doesn't leave, and yeah. he just thinks, ah, oh, she can handle all of it, hey, which is not okay. We're in the action movie part. Like, who cares about <laughs> the other people who work in a restaurant? Uh, I guess. That is very action movie of her to do. So they disapparate. They go to Grimmauld Place, and they get the vibe that someone has been here, and then they hear Severus Snape with a question mark coming from a voice that sounds exactly like Moody's. So my first thought was, yay, Moody's alive and he's chilling here. Uh, he's not. Spoiler alert, unfortunately. So the squad is then all hit with some sort of tongue-tying curse. So this Severus Snape thing must have been just a curse from Moody. So they like really struggled to talk. Then Mrs. Black appears and screams at them in this spectral form and the curtains are all shooting up and, and dust is flying all of them. And then Harry at the top of his lungs just yells, shut up. And it works, which that's great. Good to know that that's how you defeat ghosts is by yelling, shut up. Same. 
Yeah. Which I think this is something they mentioned on happening in the fifth book working too. So I just, I don't know. I just found it to be funny. How do you defeat ghosts? You yell, stop at them. Please stop. And then they do. I would watch all those shows on the Discovery Channel. <laughs> that's just like about cryptids. Ghost hunters. Where it's just like somebody screaming at monsters. <laughs> hey, Bigfoot, shut hey, up. stop. <laughs> shut up. So Hermione does a charm to see if there are any humans there. There are none, so confirmed no Moody. At least not here. I'm still holding on to hope that he might be alive. Oh, all right, bud. Uh, hey, you never know. It's in play. They haven't found the body. Okay. So Harry gets a pain in his scar, and he just gets this overwhelming sense of anger, meaning that Voldemort is very angry, and all he can see is a large shadow. He can't really make out what the vision is. So Hermione gives Harry the lecture that he anticipated when she realizes that Voldemort is getting back into him with the scar thing. He should have taken his occlumency more seriously, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Harry says that he needs to use the bathroom real quick because the pain is just too much. And he knows that something bad's about to happen. And something is. He gets semi-possessed by Voldemort. Kind of the thing that has happened in the past where he talks and says what Voldemort is currently saying. So he's just sprawled out on the floor of the bathroom. Before he runs off to the bathroom, though, a weasel Patronus comes in and says, Family safe. Do not reply. We are being watched. And they all kind of get scared. At that moment, Harry says he's got to go to the bathroom. So with this semi-possession of Voldemort, he says, More Raoul. Oh, sorry. Got to do my Voldemort voice. More Raoul? Or shall we end it and feed you to Nagini? And then a little bit more about being really ominous and then ends it with, Draco, give Raoul another taste of our displeasure. And Harry just kind of notes that this is what Draco has been put to now. So my understanding here, because they don't say it explicitly are are we just to assume that draco is doing some sort of like cruciatus curse or some sort of torturing spell to raul is that what's going on here yeah i think so it's okay. like he, he draco always seemed like an intern for voldemort <laughs> i got this sweet new internship with the death eaters they're not paying me but it's gonna look really good on an evil resume yeah and voldemort like doesn't know what to do with them like he knows he has to give them something so voldemort's like uh yeah can you like yeah, make some copies. Hey, can you just, like, put together a Facebook page for the Death Eaters? Also, can you torture this person we don't like who messed up? Yeah, it's like, I could do it, but, like, I think this would be some great on-job training for you. Yeah, and Voldemort does end it with saying, Draco, give him another bit, or face my wrath myself. So basically letting Draco, uh, you know, Draco, you go ahead and torture him. I'll step in if we need to murder him. Yeah, I'm paying him in college credit, so it's really <laughs> important for him to develop these skills. But if we need to get to the killing part, I'll step in and take over. This whole like medium type situation finishes and Hermione comes in and says, oh, Harry, do you want your toothbrush? And Harry's like, oh, yeah. And that's the end of the chapter. And that's the end of this episode of Potterless. Hey, we did it. <laughs> we did it. How do you feel about chapter eight and chapter nine? It started out so great and wonderful and beautiful. And then with the last sentence, shit hit the fan and we're right back to this book is very serious and people are dying and stuff. It's been a while since I've read The Deathly Hallows, but... I forgot that this was like the one moment of light in this entire book. Yeah, and it was something that they hinted at even at the end of the sixth book is that, well, the only good thing that people have to look forward to is this wedding, and then it's bad. And my whole fear from the moment they got to the burrow, I was afraid that this kind of thing would happen. Just it seemed like an obvious spot for the Death Eaters to try to crash. And I knew that this was going to be a bad situation just because anytime you have a wedding like this, it's not good. Like Mary Jane and Peter Parker's wedding got crashed by the Green Goblin. I'm like you know this thing is gonna happen <laughs> so i what yeah that happens that's like a, it's a thing in what in which in Spider -Man. spider man's in which spider Man cinematic universe in like all of them it happened in the cartoon show it happened in the comic books like it's a pretty common thing i just wasn't i wasn't ready for that i'm pretty sure it's harry osborne as the hobgoblin flies in and crashes the wedding sure and then takes mary jane away sure that's I'm, i remember watching it as a kid i love that cartoon a lot i believe you yeah weddings in fantasy almost never go well i haven't watched game of thrones but i know that the red wedding is the episode where everybody dies yeah that's one good example but it's just like all over time it just seems like it's bad news bears but the one thing i was going to say is i was reading this whole chapter thinking that something bad was going to happen and it just kept going and i was like oh wow they're going to get through this whole wedding with nothing bad happening and then it was the last sentence of the chapter i was like no you were so close we almost made it ah. no no ah, no Ugh. that's every one of the that's what everyone in the wedding going oh no oh that's that was their reaction ah, oh beans no. no the ministry's fallen jeez oh no Dunk. <laughs> oh, dunk. No, me. Oh, jeez. Oh, oh, shoot, uh, man. Uh, this was a good party. Oh, no. 
Wizard on. Uh, no, that's not what they say. Yeah, they say that <laughs> that's at the good They say things. Wizard on. That's what they said after they pronounced the man and wife was you may now Wizard on. <laughs> Actually, did you notice that during that part, J.K. Rowling changed it? Yes. It said you are now wedded for life or something. Yeah. You are now committed for life. That was sweet. Something that wasn't explicitly you are now man and wife. That was really sweet. I like that. I thought it was really sweet. Like when she tries, I think when J.K. and this is what this is kind of like everything we're talking about here when jk rowling like tries to push plot along or when she wants to be intentional about social issues even as small or as large as she wants to it's very good Mm -hmm. it's just like when she does it slapdash she's like well yeah well the actual quote was then i declare you bonded for life which i I think is really sweet and cute so i'm glad that we at least got some sort of break from all the sadness because objectively Chapter 8 is a very beautiful chapter. It's something that doesn't necessarily translate into this podcast to talk about, but all of the descriptions of the wedding and how the people looked and how pretty it was and the scenery, that was all very well written and well laid out. You almost feel like you are there. It's that scenic and well described. It's very descriptive and it's awesome. And it kind of sucks that we couldn't even last a full chapter of happiness and I am not anticipating much happiness for the rest of this book. Oops. Whoops. Whoops. It's not Harry Potter and the Happy Hallows. No, it's not. Or Harry Potter and the Lively Hallows. It's Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows. <laughs> Harry Potter and everyone stays positive for the rest of the book. <laughs> Harry Potter and don't worry, good things happen to the people you care about. Uh, oh. <laughs> Harry Potter and oh. the everyone ends up fine, don't worry, it's chill. I reread a summary of the first seven chapters before I started reading Mm -hmm. on Sparknotes. And I'm like, wow, this book's so dark. (laughs) Can you remind me what, and this I'm trying to probe if you hit the spoiler. Tell me, did you, have you learned stuff about Hermione's family? The only thing we've learned about Hermione's family so far is that she did the thing to make them think that their lifelong dream was to live in Australia and they've moved to Australia. Yes. Okay. So when that happened, Mm -hmm. when I first read that, I'm like, oh no. Yeah. This book is the worst. Yes. That was some serious stuff is that, oh, the only way I can keep my family safe is to trick their brains into thinking that they are so obsessed with moving to Australia that they have done so. Like she has to do questionable magic to her own family to keep them safe yeah i think that was also like the first time when i started to feel the weight of magic in like the world Mm -hmm. i know that like we've been dealing with like but magic is kind of just like uh moving the plot along putting danger making stakes but this was the first time where like it felt hermione needed to make a moral choice but like the magic itself felt casual yeah it's something where the decision is smart but when you just look at it objectively it comes across way worse than it actually is like yes it's for a good reason but mind controlling your parents like not okay how many times have we in these books like have we dealt with like changing people's memories or like looking into their past or things with the pensive Mm -hmm. like we've dealt with memory a lot but this was the first time where it's like oh you're literally changing reality with magic mind controlling your parents not okay hey how's it going it's editing mike something i neglected to talk about in the previous episode and this one is that hermione mind tricked her parents into forgetting she existed i completely missed that thanks to everyone who pointed out to me on social media or emails or whatever but i totally missed this point which makes it way darker so i'm sorry for not fully commenting on that it felt such a weight on me and i'm like oh the seventh book is not fucking around no this book is not messing around at all it is serious It is pedal to the metal. We got almost one chapter of niceness, and that's about it. So I I got you on for this fleeting glimmer of hope episode, Uh, but you're going to be back on a later one. Fear not. I'm very excited to discuss the camping chapters that everybody hates with you. (laughs) So we can get back to some more silly goofs and bits as we did in our other episodes. You know what they call me? Eric Silver, colon, glimmer of hope. Oh. I thought you were going to say Eric, silly goofs and bits, Silver. <laughs> that's good, too. I also That's also my nickname. <laughs> oh, man. So, Eric, thank you so much for joining. Hey, do you want to you talk about our other podcast for people? I do. So, Michael Schubert and I have a new podcast. I don't know when this is coming out, so it probably isn't going to be new. But Oh, yeah. By the time this releases, we will have a bunch of episodes. At the time of recording, we are just about to put up episode three. Yeah. So Horse is a NBA basketball podcast about everything except for wins and losses. Uh, Mike and I talk about the ridiculousness, the silliness of 
basketball in the 21st century. Uh, we talk about internet beefs and people making jokes with each other and like dunking on each other in podcasts and what's going on in social media. And we look at the ridiculous history of the NBA at the same time. I think it's really interesting to everyone, people who like sports, who are real basketball heads, and people who are just like trying to participate in like culture as a whole. So I think that we're really bringing people on board and I'm I'm really happy with it so far. I know we've just done episode three, mm-hmm. but I mean, it's been a really fun time. Yeah, I'm happy with it too. We're kind of bridging the gap because for people that are super into in-depth basketball stuff, this is kind of a breath of fresh air podcast where you can just talk about silly things. And for people that don't really know that much about sports, this is a fun way to welcome people in saying, hey, here's some fun stuff. You don't have to understand the sport aspect. Here's just some things that are silly. And if you like these silly things enough, maybe you'll start watching basketball. So I think it's been good. People have been very receptive of it and we're both very biased, but we think it's phenomenal. So you can just go to horsehoops.com, get all the information on that and just search horse in podcasting. We're the only one called horse. So that works out pretty horse, well for just us. Search horse. <laughs> uh, I am <laughs> we're only horse. Um, I'm also still the DM and yeah. head writer, creative person on Join the Party, mm-hmm. a lovely Dungeons and Dragons podcast, you which you should listen to. And you can find me on Twitter at L Silvero, E L underscore S I L V E R O. That is my name if I was a Lucha Libre wrestler. C. So, Eric, thank you so much for joining. Listeners, thank you so much for listening. And until next time, as they say in the wizarding world of Harry Potter, during the happy part of the wedding, before they, you know, proceed down the aisle to to leave and stuff and go to the reception. <gasps> a wizard on! <laughs> if you're all caught up on Potterless and you have no idea what to do with your life, you should check out some of their shows from Multitude. You can listen to my other podcast, Horse. There's also Spirits, which is about mythology, a Dungeons and Dragons slash audio drama hybrid, enjoying the party, and Waystation, which covers a Canadian TV show. It's all good stuff. Go to Multitude.Productions for more information. Potterless was created by Mick Schubert. It is hosted by Mick Schubert. It is edited by Mick Schubert. It is produced by Mick Schubert, as well as Leon Davis, Vicky Garcia, Aaron Johnson, Erica, and Calvin Bauer, Sadie Baird, Jesse Horgan, Natalie Klobuchar, Deborah Wilkins, Klaus Sirloku, Alex Stark, Rebecca Adamick, Frank Chiodo, Marchismo, Tori Larsic, Samantha Rose, Juan Sanfilio, Jenna Dowsett, Kieran Webb, Vita Med, Kaylin Jordan, Pontula, Rosemary Dosh, Jill Boulay, Marie Lisa C. Keen, Ariel Bird, Romina Riva de Neira, Pinky Pan, Camille Doc, Anthony Bonarigo, Russell Dunk, Dustin Nolan Cooch, Katie Rogers, Audra Indiana Mercer, Eleanor Curlin, Sydney Cawthorn, Billy Hinton, Rossane Batamana, Micah Cole, Andrea Franz, Nikita Power, Colette Smith, Trina Unadcat, Lola Palmer, Chelsea Green, Taylor Armstead, Love Cash Longer, Ali Madsen, Cassandra, Aponte, Roxy Chaos, Emilia Krauss, Sean Montag, Jeremiah E. Hurd, Sarah Nink, Jesus J. Morales, Ben Silver, Rachel Guthrie, Zachary Pulido, Jessica Ann, Natalie Jung, Arna Good, the daughter, Brandy Baldonado, Melody McGinnis, Kristen Chavez, Zach Roth, Klein, Elisa Figueroa, Diego Costa, Daisy Carrot and Sutter, Jessica Jacob, Orchid Grower, Jonathan Foy, Joe Harrison, Isabel, Steve Trelor, Vivian Santos, Samuel Minor, Victoria Renee, Elena, Takaria Ront, Darlene Ruiz, Drake Perez, James Stepp, Healy Hastings, Marino, Moster, Hannah Shepard, Angelina Withred, Ross Marie Heise, Peter Bemis, Maria Vega, Phineas Ebner, Natalie Lozano, Hermione Hoff, Victoria Julian Lee, Ganji Singh, Alex Bisholta, Brian Williams, Caitlin Sullivan, Cecily Togball, Raul Avila, Finn Stucky, Mosin, Sadiq Lee, Grace Riggle, Sammy Crazy, Raul Pineda, Ingan Odds, daughter Mary Wynn, Brian Wynn, Gate, Heidi Stoll, Alexandra Consulver, John Kotker, Jen and Juice, Seferin Bayes, Dusty Nickerim, Noel Basile, Tao, Hala O'Keefe, Emily Tyrell, Michael Russell, Robin Fernandez, Rebecca Shumway, Patricia Cologne, Aaron Rapp, Jane Lance, Will Barrington, Neil Fournier, Liz Bigelow, Mariah Noah, Brandon Pickens, Victoria Nicoletta, Saren Enslin, Claire Spencer, Teal, Sina Schutzberg, Silje Brunstad, Rod Monsony, Desiree Korf, Rory Collier, Gloria Gillum, Sarah and Patrick Donovan, Alicat 29, William Byford, Hallie Bowen, Linnea Sievert, Veronica Bartova, Everly Kindred, Kevin Harnoy, and Can't I Potter? Web designed by Kelly Beckman, and the music is by Bettina Campomanes. If you want to find us on social media, you can go to facebook.com slash potterless, twitter.com slash potterless pod, instagram.com slash potterless podcast, or reddit.com slash r slash potterless. For any and all information about the show, you can go to potterlesspodcast.com, and for bonus content, go to patreon.com slash potterless. But thank you so much for listening, and until next time, as they say in the wizarding world of Harry Potter, a wizard on!